the relations of organisms to one another and their physical surroundings. And that's the big key thing is the relationships. And uh, that's from the Oxford Dictionary. Something else that I think of when I teach ecology to students and also when I'm in uh, any uh, either wild environment or urban environment where I'm considering the ecology of the, of the place, I like to think about the, these five factors that uh, influence plant ecology. And so when you're in a space like Lighthouse Park, ask yourself, how does the geology affect the plant ecology of this space? How does the topography affect the plant ecology of this space, the climate, the biota, meaning all the other plants and animals, insects, microorganisms, and then how has time affected it and what is happening over time, like the element of time, how, how does that play into things? And so this is a fun exercise. If you can remember these things, geology, topography, climate, biota, time, it is, it is really fun to ask yourself those questions. And that is what I like to do when I go hiking. I just kind of, in a structured way, I ask myself, geology, topography, climate, biota, time. And I, it's amazing how differently you see a space when you, when you, when you look at an area through, those, uh, through that lens. I'm not sure if uh, anybody or everybody has read this book, The Invention of Nature, Alexander von Humboldt's New World. The author is Andrea Wolf. It was published in 2015. This is a fantastic book. If you haven't read this book and you're interested in plants, read this book. So Alexander von Humboldt it was a really, really interesting person. So he was, uh, some people call him the, the uh, grandfather of science. He uh, was alive in the late 18th century, early 19th century. And this was an interesting time because this is uh, at a time when people started to question the world through the lens of science, as opposed to the lens of religion. And uh, it's, it's not fair to call him a botanist or a biologist or a, a volcanologist. He was interested in everything. And so imagine this in, you know, woolen, 19th century clothes with wooden brass and glass instruments, Humboldt explored, uh, he's famous for exploring South America. So, um, you know, uh, Bolivia, for example, and, and, you know, he'd walk up mountains with all of his equipment and take measurements of temperature and altitude and air pressure and do an inventory of plants and animals. And his mind was operating on all these different levels. And he asked himself, uh, he, he questioned the natural world. And he's credited to be the, um, the first person who predicted um, the, the impact of humans on Earth. So um, the Anthropocene, he, he predicted the, uh, the impact that people would have on plants and animals and the Earth. Uh, the first person to predict uh, human-induced climate change. So a uh, very, very good book. I read this book and shortly after I read this book, I had my own Alexander von Humboldt moment. So I was fortunate enough, I tagged along with a friend of mine to Pink Mountain. So my friend Ron Long was doing and has been doing research on Pink Mountain for a number of years. This is in Northern BC. This is um, between Fort St. John and Fort Nelson, and it's just off the Alaska Highway. It's in the foothills of the Northern Rockies. And Pink Mountain has a really interesting plant community. It has plants from, you know, like that you would see at, um, in the Arctic latitudes at uh, sea level, at Arctic tundra, overlapping, converging with plants that you see um, from the Rocky Mountains. Um, and so you have a really interesting spectrum, just as like Arctic flora and boreal flora kind of uh, mix. And he was he's been curious as to why, like of all the places he's visited, he's seen so much plant diversity at Pink Mountain and he was curious to know why. So he invited me along 
to do soil inventory and to help answer that piece. Anyhow, so I asked all, you know, those questions like, you know, how for soil, how is, has the geology, you know, the parent material, the topography, the climate, the biota, of the time, how have those factors influenced the soil? And just in a nutshell here, the parent materials, check this out. This is, um, these are mineral deposits from 60 million years ago. You can see wave ripples. And this is at 6,000 feet. And you can see wave ripples from sands that were deposited 60 million years ago, 60 million years ago in shallow seas. When this part of the world was not, you know, it, it's risen out of the ground just with, um, you know, continental movement. Uh, but 60 million years ago, this area was flat and, um, and the seas were very shallow. And because of that, they're very warm and there wasn't a lot of life. So there was um, bacteria that produced a lot of, um, you know, changed the acidity of the water. The water was really, really acidic. And, um, and so the, the materials here, this, this sandstone deposit here, 60 million years ago, the soils from this, the pH is like 3.3, which is like grapefruit juice. I literally tested water from soil testing and it tasted like grapefruit juice. And um, also uh, in the same region, you have limestone. And limestone was a deposited 250 million years ago in deeper seas where there was a lot of plant and animal life and therefore a lot of calcium deposits from all of the shellfish, for example. So look at this. This is actually at 7,000 feet elevation and there's a, there's a fossilized clamshell from 250 million years ago. So these are the parent materials from the soil and they're deposited in these layers and you can see here the effects of the climate over time. And so this is a circ. These are pictures we took from a helicopter. It was fantastic. Door removed, like hanging out the side of a helicopter, touring around these mountains in the Northern Rockies. And you can see this cirque, how uh, glaciers just ripped apart the mountain. And you can see um, the scree slope from all the debris that's been eroding away and tumbling. So you've got those layers of materials and they're broken and they're tumbling down and the rocks are breaking into smaller particles. And what ends up happening is the wind hits those scree slopes, carries those sands from those parameters and deposits them along the top ridge and the backside of the uh, mountain. And so from viewers left to right, that's west to east, and the wind in the summer comes from the west and transports those particles onto the top of the mountain. And I was really curious about the wind. On the faces of those cirques, the wind might be blowing 25 kilometers an hour, in this case, 11, 12 kilometers an hour, but at the very top along the ridge, there's no wind really low down. And I sat one time with my feet dangling over one of these cirques, eating a banana, and there was butterflies like right at the ground level and my hair was blowing. And I thought, that's strange. And then it occurred to me that there's this buffered zone that is very, very close to the ground. The wind is hitting the face of the cirque. It's creating turbulence. And behind that turbulence is a protected zone where the wind shoots over. And in that protected zone is where all these sand particles are laying down. And this has been happening since the last period of glaciation. So this has been like 10, 12, 13,000 years of sand particles laying down on moss and lichen the moss and lichen decomposing, the sand particles, plants growing in that decomposition. I had a soil probe three feet down into this soil. 10,000 years of sand deposits and dropping into this wind buffered zone and, uh, and you get three feet of rich soil. And along these ridges, you get this incredible plant life. And it is the parametrial, the geology, like all, like the materials I told you about, the topography, the fact that it is steep and all these rocks tumbling and breaking because of the gravity and also the wind hitting the side of that vertical face, creating the turbulence and the climate, the wind coming off the ocean. That's geographical, right? And it's transporting particles and you get winter, that creates ice that melts and then that water flows down those faces and breaks particles up even still. 
and um, along the top you've got all these plants and you've got stone sheep and caribou and elk walking along, tumbling the rocks, you know, defecating and urinating, cycling nutrients, eating plants, and all of this is happening over time. That was my von Humboldt epiphany on Pink Mountain. And the thing is, is that you can do this at Lighthouse Park. You can do this at Lighthouse Park. You go to Lighthouse Park and you ask yourself, how is the geology like? And, you know, you've got all this granitic stone here and the topography. It's, uh, you know, not only does it uh, have, it, it's at the base of basically, um, you know, the mountains of Cypress Bull Park. And it has valleys within it and these coves and a high point and a, south side and a west side and an east side and a north side and um we're a sub-mediterranean climate so it's quite dry in the summertime and uh, because of that we're in a region of um there's like fire ecology associated with lighthouse park and in the summer you get wind off the water and all these same things you can ask yourself right and um and think about what's happening over time in the park so another question that Humboldt asked, which is a fascinating passage in the book, he is looking at these palm trees, and I, I think he's in Bolivia, and he's just sort of listing all the ways that the environment has affected the adaptation strategy of the palm. So, so I like this. Every time you, if you look at a plant, if you look at a plant, everything about that plant is a strategy for it to survive in its environment. And so it's really fun. And I know when I started learning this, I remember the first time I thought, okay, so the reason why those leaves are big is because they have to collect light in the shade. And the reason why these leaves are small is because they're adapted to full sun and they don't need that, you know? And so that's just a simple example of how the environment affects the way, you know, the shapes of plants. But the other thing to consider is how do plants affect their environment? And that is something that um, is interesting to think about. And here's an example, and I'll bring this back to Lighthouse Park, but this is the Sonora Desert <clears throat> in California, and this is creosote bush. So neat story here with creosote bush. If you notice, they're all, there's all these creosote bushes here in this um, flat desert area. And they're all about 50 to 100 feet apart. And you ask yourself why? Well, they have very, very, very shallow roots. And the roots go out about 30, 40 feet in radius from the plant. That way, when it rains, you know, and the rain doesn't go very deep into the soil, but they've got a big, big footprint where they can catch the rain. So they excrete chemicals in the roots that are actually toxic to their own species. So that way, where the root system of one plant ends, the root system of another plant will, you know, they'll meet and they won't interfere with each other. And so you don't get creosote bushes growing very close together, which is interesting. And it gives them enough space. They don't have to compete with their own species. So they're a sub shrub, but they're close to the ground and it's cooler. And being close to the ground, any of, their, any of the foliage that they create that, that dies and falls off doesn't get blown away. It actually accumulates in its own mounded shell. And so you can imagine that it's sand and it's windy all around, but underneath its own little canopy, it's created its own environment. The soil is better. It's habitat for snakes and birds and insects and rodents. And, um, and so there's all this stuff going on here, right? It, creosote bush has a really, it's called creosote bush. It smells like creosote. And that actually, these aromatic oils in this environment where it's like harshly competitive, a lot of these plants create aromatic oils that deter herbivory. So we eat a lot of herbs, you know, from the similar kinds of environments like uh, rosemary and thyme. And, you know, chopped up into a, you know, recipe, it tastes good, but it's not, doesn't taste good to eat. So this is a strategy to deter herbivory. Plus those oils actually clog up the pores that allow, you know, vapor loss. And so they reduce moisture loss in the leaves. So everything about these plants is adapted to their environment. But what's also very cool, if you notice, they actually impact their environment. And so here's a, um, a creosote bush. 
And you can see this wedge shaped, you see it's almost like it's a long triangular shape of um, plants that are growing in the leeward wind protected zone of the creosote bush. And so the creosote bush actually create, has an impact on its own environment. It actually creates a niche for all these plants to grow in. And uh, oops, I went the wrong way, but there you go. You can see the wind is coming from screen right to screen left and you can see all those strips of green and it's almost like a shadow from the wind. And here's my friend taking pictures of uh, the wonderful flowers, the Abronia and the Hesperocallus. Look at that. This is, uh, I, I was next in line. This was my picture, but uh, great plants growing in those um, strips. So very, very cool. Plants have the ability to affect their own environment as well. And, you know, subshrubs are fascinating plants. And I told you about how everything about a subshrub being mounted and tight, low to the ground, it kind of creates its own, uh, you know, the, the, you can imagine if you put your hand in there and if you didn't get bitten by a snake, you'd find leaves and you'd find nutrient cycling. But out in the exposed areas where it's hot and dry and windy, you won't get organic accumulation or nutrient cycling. So how does this connect to Lighthouse Park? Lighthouse Park has subshrubs and Arctostaphylus columbiana, hairy manzanita, is a very, very, very special plant that you can find at Lighthouse Park. They're related to Arbutus. They're in the same family, Ericaceae. And if you look at the bark, they, they actually have that same kind of bronze, cinnamon colored bark with exfoliating uh, tissues. But again, everything about this plant is adapted to its environment. And here, you, the leaf posture is vertical. And so a uh, leaf posture like this collects more light, but a plant with a vertical leaf posture, those leaves are not orientated in such a way to collect a lot of light. And a lot of times plants from sunny environments have um, like a, a silverish glaucous coating on the leaf to reflect light. Uh, Arctostaphylus actually has that silverish uh, color. And if you look, you can see very, very small hairs and those hairs actually shade the leaves. And um, just like fins on a radiator allow the plant to cool down in a hot, sunny environment. And that mounding shape is perfectly adapted to growing close to the ground, but it also, it also will, you know, these leaves on evergreen plants, they do drop off after a few years and they will accumulate at the base underneath the shell of foliage. And that allows for organic decomposition to happen in place as opposed to the wind blowing the material away. And in that you get other organisms living. You have bacteria and fungi and it's habitat for birds and snakes and rodents. And in the wind protection behind the Arctostaphylus, you'll find plants growing in that area. So like it's the same thing as the desert in a way. It's the same, same stuff. It's very, very cool. So these plants, all plants, when you observe where they grow in a natural setting, they exist in these niches. And it's wrong to say that a plant, you know, here, this is at Stanley Park. And uh, here you can see some maidenhair fern growing in a seep uh, in the sandstone in this crevice. And it's not like this plant prefers it there. The thing is, is that this plant, what happens in nature with plants is plants are all always competing and when you see plants growing in a niche, what it means is that plant has the best ability to outcompete all the other plants. What's interesting about plant ecology is that in a very stable environment, like underneath a forest canopy in Lighthouse Park where soil accumulation is pretty good and it rains a lot in this region and, um, you know, it's not, you know, un it's protected from the wind, from the tree canopy. That's a very stable environment. So you don't see a lot of plant diversity there. I mean, there's diversity, but you see big patches of ferns and big patches of mahonias. But where you find, you know, really stressful environments, you don't have these niches where competitive plants can outcompete everything. So you get really interesting pockets of plants that can thrive in these particular niches. 
And in this case, it's a stressful environment. And I don't have an image of this, but if you walk along that bulge on the other side, there's another seep and it's boykinia growing in that seep, not uh, maidenhair fern. And so just a fascinating example of the kind of diversity that you see in a stressful environment. It's, it's all about plants being able to outcompete. This little Cetomacri here is the only plant that can survive in this wind blown landscape. And look at it just thriving in that little crevice. Here's another example. This is on the North Sea. Um, and here, it, the North Sea doesn't have much of a tide, but you can see the silver plant here in the center. This is growing where the water table is very high and it's salt water. Does Artemisia maritima, the silver foliage plant here, does that prefer growing in salty soils? Um, it needs salt as part of its, you know, metabolic processes, but not that much. It doesn't prefer growing in waterlogged salty soils. The thing is, it's the only plant that will tolerate it. It's the plant that tolerates it best. If you go up the grade a little bit, and what I love about this, this site here is there's a bowl here. Uh, it, the topography is like a bowl and the plants express the gradation in the topography. So at the lowest point, you see the Artemisia, then you get up higher, you see Angelica, and you see Euphorbia palustris, and you get up even higher and you see some woody plants. And it's such a fun thing to look at, to look at the topography and look at what's going on there. So when you think about niches at Lighthouse Park, you know, they're, the reason why you see Arbutus menziesii is that, um, it doesn't prefer growing in crevices. It, it, you know, it definitely needs good drainage and it definitely, you know, um, it, uh, but this is one of the only plants that, that will actually, has the ability to outcompete in the crevices of rock that exist in between the outcropping of uh, granitic um, bedrock. And so, you know, you can grow Arbutus menziesii in a nursery pot in peat and perlite and water and fertilizer, and it'll grow really well. It probably prefers that, but at Lighthouse Park, it is the only plant that has the ability to outcompete others in these crevices. And you'll see, also, you'll see Douglas firs growing in those crevices, but because it is a harsh environment out on the uh, edge of Lighthouse Park, Douglas fir doesn't have the ability to outcompete uh, Arbutus in, in the same way. You go inland onto the park a little bit where the soils are better and you see a very competitive stand of Douglas fir that will outshade Arbutus menziesii. But out on the edge where there's more wind and it's, uh, the, the rock is, uh, you know, out exposed and there's less organic accumulation and all you're dealing with is these crevices, you see more diversity out on the out on the edge than you do inside because of the conditions. And it's really interesting to take a look. I just love looking at plants growing in harsh environments. In these crevices of rock, you've got, uh, this is at Lighthouse Park, you've got heuchera that'll grow in these crevices. You've got in seeps out there, you have uh, monkey flower, erythranthi, uh, growing where there's water seeping out through crevices. Uh, you have, oh my God, you've got the wonderful lichens and mosses that grow on the rock. And what's actually really um, troubling, I think, about Lighthouse Park is the amount of foot traffic out on the outcrop rock. Because like I showed you in a previous um, Lighthouse Park series talk, if you go up to the Sunshine Coast, for example, at Francis Point or uh, Daniel Point, these are the examples I showed you earlier, where there's less foot traffic, the um, outcrop of rock is actually covered in this crust of lichen and moss. And at Lighthouse Park, just from the amount of visitation and foot traffic, that crust of lichen and moss doesn't exist um, in the same way. And it is incredible. In fact, when you think about sheets of rock, what can grow on a sheet of rock? Moss and lichen. So moss and lichen grow on that rock and then the wind coming off the water and the waves blasting against the rock, those activities break the rock up and there's, you know, tidal action at, uh, on beach shores where there's tumbling rocks. All of that rock is being broken down into sand and those sand particles get blown and they get caught in the moss and the lichen. 
And so then you start having soil accumulating and the moss and lichen decomposes and plants grow in there and you've got roots growing and decomposing. And over time, you actually get a crust of soil and you have habitat for plants. And it's a very fragile habitat. It'll take 10,000 years for that to, you know, to evolve. But, you know, one person scraping it away with their foot and it's gone. And in that moss and lichen at Lighthouse Park, and these are all pictures I've taken from Lighthouse Park, you have incredible plants that grow, like this Corydalis sempervirens, which is, um, that'll be flowering very shortly. And uh, what a precious little plant growing in these lovely lichen and moss beds. Like, oh my God, they are so beautiful. They really are. And Brodea, oh, this is such a great bulbous plant. This is a bulb. And um, so bulbs, the geophytes, they are adapted to stressful environments. So Brodea will be flowering soon. And, you know, like a tulip or a daffodil, it will produce leaves and then it'll flower. But then when the conditions get too dry for the plant to grow, it will retract all of the, you know, the... Um, the food, the carbohydrates that it uh, makes in its leaves and uh, go into a period of dormancy and wait until the next opportunity next spring to grow and flower. So its whole life cycle is adapted to the niche in the season, you know? Um, Lighthouse Park, it's very, very hard to find Brodea. If you go to some of these other places, you know, where there's less, fewer people, you will see more lichen, more moss, and more brodea, but at Lighthouse Park is very difficult. You can find it, but it's very difficult to find. And it's because that, that really, really precious habitat of the moss and lichen beds um, is gone. And, you know, just speaking of lichen, uh, this is one of the coolest one. This is called um, uh, reindeer moss, uh, Cladonia rangiferina. Um, Lichen is very interesting. If you didn't know, it, lichen is a composite species. So it is actually a, a species that is made up of algae or cyanobacteria or, and fungi. And so you've got algae and fungi together manifesting as a lichen. So it's kind of like this hybrid of two completely different species that exist together symbiotically and produce, um, you know, what you see as lichen, which is just fascinating. So other bulbous plants that will grow in these environments, you have chocolate lilies as well, Fritillaria camchatsensis, and this is a very, very special plant. Um, you know what's really neat is the camchatsensis, you know, the Kamchatka from camchatsensis, that refers to like the Kamchatka Peninsula, in, um, in northeastern Russia. What's, very, what's really interesting about this species and its range of distribution up into that northeastern part of, um, of Asia is that there are a number of plants uh, that have migrated from northeastern Asia. You know, the last period of glaciation along the coast, there, there was the Bering Land Sea Bridge of ice. And a lot of plants migrated across that Bering Land Sea Bridge down into BC, Alaska, you know, Yukon, BC, and all the way down, in some cases, um, coastal strawberry, the Fregaria chiloensis, is a stoloniferous plant, and it migrated all the way across the Bering Land Sea Bridge down Alaska, one stoloniferous leap at a time, all the way down BC, all the way down through California, into Central America, all the way down South America to the southern tip of Chile. Ha! Uh, I just love that. You know, when you think it, when you learn about plants and you learn about the stories of plants, the biogeography, you think about the distribution of where you see them and you see closely related plants, and you think about plant migration over time. And things like this fertile area, you just, you just imagine how long it took for that plant to migrate that far, uh, you know, and this is not a plant that uh, has the ability to move quickly. Very beautiful though. Uh, and then I always, I like the erythroniums at, at Lighthouse Park. Um, they've just finished actually now. And uh, to me, they're like little ghosts of a the forest. They're so pretty. 
Um, and again, these are plants that grow in that really, really precious crust of moss and lichen that grows on the outcrop rock. And then, you know, you've got your uh, lilies, right? Your um, Lilium columbianum that grow uh, in slightly deeper soils underneath the conifers. Uh, and these have a wide range of distribution in uh, Western North America. You know, it's really fun if, you, oh, sorry. <laughs> Look, jumping ahead and then jumping back. Um, what's really fun about Lilium columbianum is to observe the pattern of speckling, speckling on the underside of the petals and compare it because there's a lot of, they express themselves differently. Like, you know, just like all of us, we all look a little different. Well, lilies, the, sometimes you'll see them where the speckles are really, really concentrated or they're kind of in stripes or they're almost absent. And so it's really fun to kind of look at a variety of uh, plants and compare the speckle patterns. And then Allium cernuum, this is nodding onion. This is a lovely plant. This is a really, really, it's one of my, well, I was gonna say one of my favorite native plants, but I don't know why I would say that. I just, um, I just love the dusty pink. I love the nodding posture of the flowers. And this actually uh, has a wide range of distribution. Like you'll see this growing in the prairies, for example, wild. What's interesting about plants and when you observe plants is their sociability, like how they interact with each other. So this is a, a photo from Armenia, and this is interesting. So this is in the center of this depression. This is Caltha palustris, growing where it's really wet. And you can see that where the Caltha palustris stops and the, there's a band in the middle where you can see a little bit of pink where my friend Julia, you can't really see, but all of this in here is pink. There's primulas in there. And then the primulas stop, and then it's ranunculus. And what's really interesting about this example is that one species stops and another one starts, and the line between them is, is very, very abrupt. And that's, that's naturally occurring. But what's interesting is um, you don't always, oops, sorry about that. You don't always see that. For example, look at this. This is on the Black Sea, and this is sea holly. And this is the high tide line, and you've got sea holly like growing right in the sand. You can grow this in your garden, people do. And um, uh, getting up onto the dune, you see the sea holly starting to mingle a little bit with the grasses. And then at the top of the dune, you can see that there is clearly a point where there's more grasses than um, eryngium. But what you see is uh, a mingling, a sociability where it's hard to really identify exactly where the grass stops and the eryngium starts. And uh, I really enjoy observing that, this, this transition, this threshold of one species into another. Sometimes it's abrupt and sometimes there's a mingling. And that to me, that is what I understand uh, to be a plant sociability, like the ability of plants to kind of grow with each other and mingle. And, um, you know, different plants have, like the, um, in, in this example, Caltha palustris, it does not have very sociable uh, qualities. It's a big mounding plant. It will just smother things, right? Whereas the eryngium is loose and airy and the grasses are too. So they have the, they just physically have the ability to mingle. And again, this is a low resource environment and you have more diversity in a small space High resource environment, you got lots of water, you have one competitive plant that just dominates. So again, another example of how in a high diversity environment, you have more, uh, sorry, in a, in a low resource environment, you have more diversity. And that is exemplified here. This is on the leeward side of that same dune. And you can see how many species can we see? I see euphorbia, I see stachys, I see eryngium, I see choleria. I see another grass that I can't identify. There's probably about 12 species of plants there. That's a lot of diversity for, for one um, plant community. Whereas where the resource, like if you go further inland here where you can see there's more moisture, it's all going to be ash trees, for example, less diversity. And, you know, an example uh, of this at Lighthouse Park, which is really interesting, like the sociability of plants. I'm really fascinated with, you know, um, the, the, the occurrence of plants within a community. And so you think about the trees that you see at Lighthouse Park. You've got the conifers, the big species. You've got Douglas fir. You've got Western red cedar. You've got Western hemlock. And also within that, you have Pacific yew. Here on the coast, 
the Douglas fir, the western hemlock, the western red cedar, they occur in stands and they will <clears throat> either be in, like where it's wetter, you'll see more red cedars, where it's drier, you'll see more Douglas firs, but you'll see stands of trees where you can stand in one place and you could count, you know, dozens of one species. Whereas Pacific U, Taxus brevifolia, within that same matrix of plants, you're just going to see it occurring infrequently. And that's what makes it a really special tree to find, is that it does occur infrequently within that matrix. And uh, that is an element of sociability, like how plants mix and, you know, the, the occurrence, the patterns. And that is so much fun to observe, is to go into a place like Ladhouse Park, look at, you know, first of all, take an inventory of what you're seeing and then look for patterns. Look for those shelter zones in the wind. Look for that rate of occurrence. Look for, you know, the mingling of species. There's just, uh, it's really fun. So topography is also something to consider. And this is, um, I'm telling you, uh, Alexander von Humboldt was, um, uh, you know, thinking of many things. And one of my favorite, um, I've got one of these uh, posters in my office and uh, this is a drawing that he has done, a diagram, and you can see that there is uh, a coast on your left, and um, it, you know, then it rises up into a mountain. Uh, there is a dormant volcano, an active volcano, and then on the backside of that, you have the, um, the, uh, the wind protected, uh, the, the um, what's the word, sorry, the, um, the rain shadow. Ah, the rain shadow of the mountains. And so what he has done though, is, is he's drawn this diagram of the coast, the grade in elevation, the top of the mountain and the rain shadow of the other side. And these tables on the left and the right indicate the species that you would observe at different aspects and different elevations and on both sides. And um, <laughs> that is just like, and, and he's done birds and plants and animals and, um, uh, temperatures and elevations and, you know, fascinating stuff, soil conditions. So here's an example. This is in um, Western Asia. And this is just, you know, an abstract example here, but here's a hill and this is the south side. And at the base, you see these purple flowers. This is an orchid. This is Dactylorhiza and it grows, you know, a month before this was, this was in April, but a month before there was snow up here melting. And so all that water drained down and at the bottom of the slope, it's still wet. And the Dactylorhiza thrives in moist soil. So it's growing where it's wet. But then you go up a little higher and you don't see any Dactylorhiza. Can you see this red peppering throughout this on the mid-range of the mountain? Um, and you know what that is? That's tulips. Tulips and, and myosotis, forget-me-nots, growing in the wild. This is Tulipa julia and myosotis um, asiaticus my, uh, orientalis. One of those two, I forget. Anyhow, but they're growing, you know, uh, about 200 feet higher than the orchids because it's drier here. And so this is the Humboldt diagram. This is how, as you go up, you notice different species. And you can do this at Lighthouse Park. You start off where it's low and you walk up and you just watch the species change. And if you take that all the way up to, say, Black Mountain in West Vancouver, you go higher up into Cypress, you know, Bowl Provincial Park, um, in, into Cypress Bowl, you will see species change as you go up higher in elevation. You will see uh, red alder graduate to Sitka alder. You will see western hemlock graduate to mountain hemlock. You will see, you know, fewer Douglas firs. As you get up even higher, you'll see subalpine fir. You know, you see the same transition. And on that south face, because it's hot and dry, you don't get a lot of organic decomposition because you know, plant leaves, the detritus from dead plant leaves dries up and blows away and it doesn't stay put and decompose. Too dry, too windy. You get onto the top and it's flat and there had been snow melted there recently and so it's still quite, it, it's still moist and you can see the plant community changes. And here you have a high resource environment. It's flat, the soil is deep and it's moist and you see all of this prangus here, which looks like dill. Um, and it's dominating and high resource, low diversity. Down on this side, you've got low resources and much higher diversity. So you go up and over and onto the north side and it's a whole different plant community because it's shaded, it's moist, there's decomposition. 
and the soil is black because of all of that and you've got a whole different plant community and you can do the same thing you can observe these things on all the different aspects of lighthouse park look at that you know the same hill two different sides two different soils so same thing here and you've got like these valleys you know you've got the main pathway which is a valley you've got this valley that goes up here where i think on the last um talk i was showing you how in here you've got you know lots of uh, western red cedar and up higher you've got douglas firs and so you know there's topography here and how much fun would it be to explore the whole park and take an inventory of what you see on the south side the west side the top the back side so there you go things are always cycling in nature and so here's a beech forest with rhododendrons and these are just other places i've been i don't actually have a big you know inventory of pictures from Lighthouse Park, but it's kind of fun to just sort of see it, you know, see these systems happening in other environments and then think of Lighthouse Park. But you've got beech trees. They produce so much foliage and all that biomass is coming. You know, think about where all that biomass is coming from. That is nutrients from the soil, carbon from the air, hydrogen from the water, combining to make carbohydrates and tissues and all of that leaf and wood eventually dies, falls, is it decomposes and you've got plants like these rhododendrons growing in that uh, leaf litter and there's just this constant cycle happening of all those of of carbon of water of all the nutrients nitrogen phosphorus potassium calcium magnesium sulfur cobalt aluminum you know it's all cycling and you can see the same processes at lighthouse park you see a dead tree or a dying tree and, you know, the gardener in you says, oh, that's terrible. You know, the trees are dying. But, you know, it's so important to understand the role of decay in a healthy plant community. And so that is a normal process. And that is an important process. It's part of the cycling of carbon and nutrients. Recruitment. So this is multiple generations. And look at this. You've got this Choya cactus. Look at all of its, its spawn at its base. But the wind is blowing these plants. I love this because you've got this, you've got multiple generations. And again, the pattern of occurrence here is triangular shaped and that is all wind formed. But you've got mother plants and daughter plants and granddaughter plants and they're all moving in the wind. A healthy plant community has plants of many different ages. And same thing here with the saguaro cactuses. You've got Swirl cactuses, they germinate every, you know, few dozen years. You get a good year and you get a, another generation of saguaro cactuses. So in a healthy saguaro forest, you've got older saguaros with multiple branches. You've got uh, middle-aged ones with just like one shoot and a couple of nubs. And then young ones, just single shoot saguaros. So Lighthouse Park, you know, it's old growth forest. You've got trees that are 500 plus years old. And ultimately, those trees will, you know, die and you'll see uh, young Douglas firs, old Douglas firs, you'll see all, you know, multiple generations, it's a healthy forest. And the interconnectedness of everything. And this was, if you read The Invention of Nature, one of the big themes that Humboldt touches on is the interconnectedness of everything. And that goes back to the geology, the topography, the climate, the biota, the time, all of those factors interconnected. And here's an example of this lovely plant in the family Orobankaceae. It's parasitic relationship with the yarrow. Uh, doesn't even have leaves, gets all of its nutrients from the, um, from the yarrow. And you see that at Lighthouse Park, you see uh, coral Ariza. And we talked about coral rhiza and its relationship with Douglas fir and hemlocks. And, you know, a non-photosynthetic plant tapped into the trees and deriving nutrients from the trees. And you see uh, things like uh, big leaf maple. And big leaf maple will exude calcium and magnesium through its bark. And there's nutrient there. And in, you know, especially on this big horizontal limb, you get moss that grows and holds moisture and you get licorice fern growing on specifically big leaf maple because of the texture of the bark and the exudation of nutrients. And last week we talked about the interconnectedness of trees and their fungal networks. And we talked about mycorrhizae and how trees are, uh, there's a, you know, a network of trees in the forest. And we looked at the example of living stumps where 
you know, a tree that has been cut down keeps growing because it's pulling nutrients from another tree within its network through that network of fungal mycelium. Amazing. And all of this, and the great thing about plant ecology is that it is dynamic. It is changing over time. It is never the same. And so, you know, think about Lighthouse Park, actually. In nature, you have successive plant communities that will build on one another. And then you have a disturbance and the whole thing gets reset to zero. So at Lighthouse Park, a disturbance there could be a major storm. It could be a windstorm that blows trees over. Um, it could be a forest fire. And in our region is, you know, a, a, the plant community is adapted to fire, the cycle of fire. And so you get a forest and it burns and uh, you've got, you know, an absence of conifers, but you get all the herbaceous plants and alders where the soil is good. And you get a lot of arbutus that respond to that disturbance. And then over time, what happens is you get a lot of, you know, you get woody plants that like the Douglas firs start growing in the crevices again, and they'll shade out the arbutus. And over time, the Doug firs will get old, be hundreds of years old, and they get wind pruned and thin and they fall over. And there's another generation of trees, Western hemlocks that will come up in their place. And so you've got this constant evolution of plant succession and and it's never it's never the same things are always changing in nature and so those are the things that i think of when i'm exploring a wilderness plant area right like and that's what lighthouse park is it's a little fragment of wilderness in west vancouver and we have access to this and when you explore it you can think about all of those things you can ask yourself how does the geology, how does the topography, how does the climate, how does the other plants and animals, the biota, how is that all impacting what I see and how is that changing over time? How much time did it take for that to, you know, to happen? Um, and think about all of the questions that Humboldt asked, like how is the environment shaping the plants that I'm seeing? How are these plants adapted to this environment? And what opportunities are they providing for other plants? How are the plants shaping the environment, right? So, you know, these are the things that I ask when I go into a wilderness area and look at plants, and it is so much fun. And I hope that when you go to Lighthouse Park, you can think about, uh, you know, the park differently and ask yourself these very same questions. It, uh, it really makes a visit to any natural place so rich uh, you can do it on your own, or you can have a, a conversation with somebody else about those things. And either way, it's just a lot of fun. Thank you very much. That's all I got to say about the ecology of Lighthouse Park for today. I wonder what questions we have here. So um, it says here, with the flowers being pollinated and blown off the big leaf maples at this time of year, where... To, uh, where do the seed keys come from uh, in the trees in autumn? Well, okay, no, it's not, that's a good question. So the life cycle, the question here is, you know, you've got the pollen that's blowing around now, but you got the seeds in the fall, right? And so what's going on there? So big leaf maples are wind pollinated. They have incredibly beautiful pendulous racemes of chartreuse flowers. And, you know, right now people have, you know, allergies because of the pollen. And what's happening is the male, male flowers are, are uh, fertilizing the female flowers. And, it, and then from that point forward, once you have a pollen grain that goes down the pollen tube and fertilizes the ovary, then you get the development of a seed. And it takes, it takes basically all of the season for that seed to develop and mature properly. And then develop all of the structures, like the wings on the Samara that um, basically will, in the fall and the winter, that will, the seed can be dispersed through its mechanism of flight. Um, but it takes all summer for that embryo to develop into a seed. Um, and so, so that's, that's what's happening there. It just, it, it's, what's really fun to also think about with plants is to ask yourself, what do I know about this plant and its life cycle through the year? Or it's, you know, is it, uh, when is it vegetative? When is it reproductive? When is it producing fruit? You know, like these are really neat questions. 
Question here, do the mosses and lichens themselves cause the rock to break down? And the answer is yes. So what's really neat about Lighthouse Park is you've got these slabs of outcrop granitic bedrock. And that is the parent material that ultimately will be the soil that you can find, you know, underneath the trees in the park where you, you can imagine there's depth of soil. All of those particles basically came from that rock. And what are the processes that are turning the rock into soil? It's the erosion from wind. It's like literally the wind will actually move particles um, and break the rock down over thousands of years. It's the waves blasting against the rocks. It's the you know, they, they, the expansion and contraction, when they get warm, they expand, when they get cold, they contract. And over years, you get cracks and, um, and plants will root down into those cracks and drive those cracks apart and basically break off pieces of rock that will tumble down and, you know, get wave eroded. So those are all processes, but also the moss and lichen will excrete chemicals and there's chemical weathering as well. So there's, you know, acids and other chemicals that will break down the rock. And so the lichen and the mosses will contribute towards the chemical weathering of rock. And they will also contribute towards the plants. Like, you know, they provide uh, a, a, a surface that, you know, sand particles will stick to and get trapped in. And that provides a thin layer of soil for plants to grow in. And those plants will ultimately, some of them are big and some of them are small, but they will root into crevices and those crevices break open. And so there's all these processes and it's the climate, it's the other biota, the plants, it's the topography, you know, when things break and fall, there's like gravity that's causing that to happen. Um, and that's happening over time. And the parent material is the geology. And so there you go, you've got geology, topography, climate, biota, time, all of that happening with lichen on rock, you know, and moss on rock. It says here, does moss grow differently on various species of trees? And the answer is yes. So I am not um, an expert on mosses and lichens, but I have friends who are. And it is fascinating because, you know, there are mosses that will grow in a wide range of uh, habitats. And there are some that are very specific to certain niches and um, lichens as well. And, uh, you know, that is not my expertise, but um, friends, friends of mine who are, re you know, really, really, I, I've got a friend who's a master's degree uh, biologist and, um, oh, he's fascinating. He's just a fascinating guy. He came up to Pink Mountain with us and uh, did an inventory of mosses on, um, on Pink Mountain and uh, described a new species for that region. And so, um, you know, fascinating stuff. Um, and then uh, it says here, thanks, Egan, are Pacific U's under threat? And I would say that, um, I would say the answer to that is, are they under threat? There's a lot of Pacific U in BC. In fact, if you go up to, um, uh, you know, the Rocky Mountains, like up by Banff and Jasper, for example, it's interesting because here Pacific U occurs infrequently, but in other parts of the province, you'll find like Pacific U growing in, in dense thickets. Uh, that's another interesting thing. Like if you were really knowledgeable about the plants at Lighthouse Park and you understand that composition, when you go elsewhere in, in BC or um, Western North America, you will see the same species growing in a different plant community and they behave differently. Um, like a good example of that would be uh, Saskatoon. You see Saskatoon in Lighthouse Park where it's growing on the rock, I've seen it growing like a prostrate, like, you know, like a ground covering, you know, woody plant. Uh, Saskatoon elsewhere can be a big, almost tree-like shrub, you know? I'd say Pacific U are probably, you know, in, in Lighthouse Park, uh, there's, that's something that is very special because, you know, if you removed five of them, that might be a large percentage of that that you know area's population but they do occur infrequently on the north shore mountains and you you can easily find them so i wouldn't say they're under threat um in your background photos there are some pine trees are those shore pines and are those the same trees that grow in peat bogs yes they are shore pines and uh, pinus contorta is a very interesting species pinus contorta has the uh, ability to adapt to such a wide range of conditions 
So in fact, behind in my headshot here, that looks like a Pinus contorta growing out of the rock in a crevice and it is adapted to the salt spray and will grow out of like, you know, in the like wind sheared, you know, no soil, but it'll also grow in a bog. And it's uh, one of the few pines that's adapted to poorly aerated soils that are waterlogged. Um, and then last week we talked about uh, Pinus contorta. Uh, on the coast, shore pine is, um, has a different form, but if you go into the rain shadow of the Cascade Mountains and in the Cascade Mountains, you see um, uh, lodgepole pine. Same species, different subspecies. So that's Pinus contorta subspecies latifolia as opposed to the Pinus uh, contorta subspecies contorta down here. And then that same species going down into California, you get subspecies Belanderi, subspecies Miriana. There's another one and I can't think of it right now. Um, and it's the same species that expresses itself differently in different regions. Um, it's a neat, neat tree. Another question, where would we be likely to find the Arctostaphylus on south facing slopes? So yeah, there at Lighthouse Park, I, I know where there's some Arctostaphylus columbiana growing and um, they're growing out in the outcrop and on the south side, on the west side, there's not a lot. It's um, a plant that, uh, you know, would also not occur that in, you know, uh, very big solid masses. One thing that's really sad is the biggest one that I know of um, is actually pretty easy to get to. And uh, I'd been looking at that plant for years and about five years ago, um, I saw it had such a nice form and a really big trunk. Like this was like an old growth uh, manzanita. And uh, I saw some damage from, clearly from somebody who pushed their way in to get a picture, right? And so uh, that was uh, disappointing, but um, it's a lovely plant. And when it flowers in the spring, um, it's very pretty. The bark is lovely. Um, yeah, just uh, hunt for them, hunt for them, and um, and don't step on their roots. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, that hey, is hey, it for questions. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to bring um, Alexandra Mancini in. I just take a minute. Ah, oh, here she comes. So Alexandra Mancini is the uh, president of the Lighthouse Park Preservation Society. And uh, he's just going to tell us a little bit. Can hear me. Hi, Alexandra. I can hear you now. I'm just trying to get my camera to go. Oh, um, dear. Okay. Well, it, 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 that, it, might be, that might be my problem. It says the host has stopped it. That's correct. Okay, definitely my problem then. Well, why don't you just talk and I will sure. work on getting you um, That's fine. seen so people can see your face. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. It's, it's not essential as long as everyone can hear me. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to Egan for an amazing presentation. I learned so much from that. Thank you so much. It was excellent. Thanks. And um, and so it's a hard act to follow for me, but <laughs> I'll do my best to tell you a little bit about our society, the Lighthouse Park Preservation Society. So we, um, we started as a formal society, as a registered charity in 1998. So we're up to 22 years now. And it is a 100% a volunteer effort that is um, involved in this society. We have no paid employees. But we have a lot of volunteers on our board of directors and also in, in many other elements of what we do. Uh, our focus when we got started uh, many years ago, I've been involved with the society, not for the entire 22 years, but for 15 years now. And our focus initially was to start, of course, the, the reason for the society is to focus on the preservation of the natural environment in Lighthouse Park. And, um, the early activities involved removing invasive plants, uh, plants that many of you know well, uh, English ivy, holly, laurel, scotch broom, things like that. Over the years, uh, as, as large patches of, say, ground cover ivy were removed, um, it was felt that there was a need for restoration plantings in some areas, and we started doing that, replacing the um, 
monoculture of ivy <laughs> with um, some a, a mixture of nice uh, native plants. Um, we've been very successful over all these years and those of you who enjoy going to Lighthouse Park can, can appreciate what has been uh, maintained. If you compare to some other uh, other beautiful areas but that haven't had as much volunteer support perhaps um, like Stanley Park um, we don't have the uh, in the ivy invasion in Lighthouse Park the way they still do in Stanley Park so we, we feel very proud of what we've accomplished over the years um, in 2005 we expanded our scope to adopt five more neighborhood parks uh, that are adjoining or very close to Lighthouse Park. And the, the primary reason at the beginning was to prevent invasion into Lighthouse Park of the plants that were in these other parks that were invasive species. So the parks that we adopted at that time was Caulfield Park, Kluchman, Trails, The Dale, and North Piccadilly Park. And another upside of having adopted these parks is that I think we have been able to improve the environment well enough to establish um, robust wildlife corridors as well. So it isn't just the plant community that has benefited, but the, the rest of uh, the rest of the uh, wildlife as well, the, the birds and the mammals and the little, the little critters. So we're very pleased with that. I, sh I should mention though, I got a bit ahead of myself here that, it, that as a volunteer group um, we must work under the supervision of the District of West Vancouver. Uh, this is the parks belong to the District of West Vancouver and and therefore we coordinate all our work with them and they've been very supportive over the years of everything we have done. Uh, we have also expanded our focus into providing educational uh, programs um, Newsletter twice a year is produced. We have a speaker series um, of talks that we often host at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. And we have some in the park as well. And we work extensively with the schools in West Vancouver to uh, get the students involved in many hands-on projects. And we've provided some lectures in the classroom. So I just want to end by mentioning our website. If, if you would like to go and, and look at information on that website, it's uh, www.lpps for Lighthouse Park Preservation Society.ca. And there are ways that you could help our society if you're interested to, to help us. First of all, we're always looking for more members. Uh, our membership fees are very modest. Uh, so, but that is one option. You could be a member. We also are looking for volunteers and you do not have to be a member to become a volunteer. And in volunteering, we have, of course, our work parties in the parks, but we also have other administrative roles for the society if you in the park. So I want to thank all our volunteers who for 22 years have worked so hard to help keep Lighthouse Park, uh, a beautiful park that it still is today. Our work is not done. Uh, we will continue. We're on a bit of a hiatus right now because of the COVID-19 situation. But um, a few of us are itching to get into the park to get the scotch broom that's in, in the bloom at the moment. But we won't be able to host a, a usual work party this year. And with that, I'll say thank you. Thank, thank you, Alexandra. I'm very sorry I never got your video ready, but we heard you loud and clear. And um, thank you for all the good information about your society and doing wonderful work to preserve Lighthouse Park. So thanks very much. And You're yeah, welcome. I think that's it for today. Um, thank you, Egan. It's been so much fun to do this webinar series with you. And uh, I, I have learned so much. And I know from all the comments I've got from our attendees that people have really enjoyed it. So. Thank you so much for, for doing that. Um, I just want to let everybody know that I have recorded today's uh, webinar um, and it'll be up on the West Vancouver Memorial Library YouTube channel where you can actually find last week's webinar as well. And that's it. And, and thank you everybody for, for uh, logging in today and um, spending your Sunday afternoon with us. It's been really great to connect. Um, the library, as you know, is closed at the moment. And we're doing as much as we can virtually. There's more great programs coming up. So check out our website for that. Okay, great. Thanks very much. I'll just log off now. Bye-bye. Bye, Thanks, Thanks so long. Bye everybody. Bye. Nice to see you, Alexandra. Thanks, everyone.
拜拜。Bye bye